Hello, everybody. Um, Dr. Bashar Bilgicha from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. I'll be talking about antibody purification uh, using an unconventional nucleotide binding site. Now, this nucleotide binding site is not well known. And uh, although, despite the discovery that was in 1996 with a publication in PNAS, uh, it hadn't been well characterized. And so when I started out as an assistant professor uh, 15 years ago, uh, the first thing I did was to uh, investigate whether or not these pockets really existed. Well, so it's described to be on the variable region on the fab. As you can see in this box on the left side, this is an IgG. Uh, the green is the light chain, the blue is the, uh, the heavy chain. The dark green and the dark blue region is where the variable domain is. But as everybody knows by now, the, um, the pocket is not entirely, or the, the, the uh, variable region is not entirely variable. The, really, the variable region is the hypervariable domain, which is made out of the six complementary to determining uh, region loops. These six loops, three on the heavy chain, three on the light chain, shown in this uh, crystal uh, structure overlay on the very top of the graph where you see the uh, misaligned uh, sequences on top of each other is where the antigen binding site is, where the complementary to determining region is. The rest of the sequences align particularly well because those are actually framework regions, although it is part of the variable domain, they're not variable and they're conserved. And so what we did was we took about, uh, at the time, there were 260 uh, something antibody crystal structures available in the protein data bank. We took them all, we superimposed those structures. I'm only showing 16 or so of them here. Um, and we looked at if they were conserved, you know, sequences residues that made up a pocket that made up a pocket on the side of the uh the fab region and what we found out was that uh, which is shown here with the side chains conserved three tyrosine and a tryptophan residue that make up this pocket uh on the side as uh, defined to be called the nucleotide binding site now Different colors, the green is uh, indicate different isotypes of antibodies. The green is IgG, the purple is IgE, and uh, the orange is IgM. These antibodies are from various different species. So human, rats, you know, uh, rabbits, uh, all, all sorts of, uh, you know, horses, all sorts of different antibodies uh, originating from different species. And these residues that make up that nucleotide binding site are conserved not just between isotypes of antibodies, but also through species as well. And not only these residues conserved at those specific locations, but their side chain conformations were also conserved. So the next thing that we did was to uh, take these crystal structures and start looking at small molecule libraries and doing docking uh, studies using in silico approaches. What we found out was that uh, we found multiple different sequences, uh, you know, small molecules that fitted into that pocket and aligned itself. In this particular case, I'm showing how uh, indole tributary acid or IBA fits into this pocket and aligns itself uh, with the tryptophan side chain indole. And uh, through the pi pi stacking, it uh, is making favorable interactions. We determined the binding affinity uh, to be ranging somewhere between one and eight micromolar, uh, the KD. And that is not because the pockets really varied, but it was because of constrictions at the lip of the pocket that prevented the entrance of the molecules into that site. And so, but the 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 off rate uh, would be the same it's just which is if what is affected is the on rate constant now we evaluated and uh developed multiple different technologies around this pocket and uh you know uses thereof including antibody uh purification which i'll be describing but we've also developed methods around site specific conjugation as well as an uh, allergy inhibitor that we used um 
use this pocket for a heterobivalent inhibitor design that uh, the inhibitor that sits in the antigen binding site, its binding is improved and the efficacy of inhibition is improved by making the molecule bivalent through conjugation to um, a nucleotide binding site targeting ligand. In this antibody purification uh, application, we have two different methods that we have developed, but I'll, I'll first focus on the resin application. The idea is pretty simple. We mobilize the nucleotide binding site uh, targeting ligands on resins, um, just like with any other affinity purification method. The antibody will be captured through its interaction of its nucleotide binding sites. And, you know, keep in mind that an intact antibody, uh, an IgG, is going to have two active nucleotide binding sites. So they will be very effectively captured and all the contaminants or misfolded or monovalent antibodies will just elute through. So the column is, uh, as you can see, this is a very you know small column uh, that we made multiple different resins and packed it into this column. And the idea is to um, use uh, the column to capture the antibodies and elute everything else. So the chromatogram that you see at the bottom is uh, the impurities just elute because they're not captured as soon as the injection is done. You know, the, the void volume comes out at two and a half, three minutes. And uh, by changing the buffer, running buffer to a Lucian buffer, we're able to get out uh, the pure antibodies, a single clean peak. The two buffers that we use for this process, uh, the first one is equilibration buffer or the capture buffer. It has 100 millimolar sodium phosphate and three millimolar, th I'm sorry, three molar sodium chloride at neutral pH. The elution buffer doesn't have the sodium chloride. Uh, the change in the ionic strength of the buffer is what's uh, yielding the elution of the antibody. It's the, the, the binding of the uh, ligand to this pocket is through hydrophobic interactions and increase in salt uh, increases the affinity of the ligand to the antibody when the salt is removed and the antibody is eluded. And the resin uh, is a, uh, well, it's an amino link uh, resin from Thermo Fisher. It's basically an agarose based uh, amine reactive uh, resin. So we uh, took this resin and now modified the surface accordingly. And then when we make this using the nucleotide binding site ligand to the column, uh, it costs about $100 per gram of resin. Um, when we purchase the resin from Thermo Fisher, but if, uh, equivalence, you know, protein A column costs 14 times as much. So, all right. So the first injections uh, that we've done on this column was to prove that it's uh, able to capture antibodies. And so we started working with pure antibodies like the bevacizumab and rituximab. And in both, both cases, you see that uh, increased volumes with a constant uh, concentration of each one of those antibodies um, is uh, well basically resulting an increase in the height of the uh, elution peak where the antibody is eluding out and it's just showing a very efficient uh, capture of these antibodies in each case. The uh, in injection concentration is also evaluated in the Earlier uh, slide, I showed the concentration was constant. We increased the volume of injection. In this one, uh, we kept the volume constant, but we increased the concentration. Uh, it, it, each injection up to 300 micromolar concentration of bevacizumab, and we're able to um, capture still, capture and retain the uh, antibody on the resin until we uh, use the elution buffer. Uh, I am not showing the increased concentrations for rituximab and the uh, chromatograms on the right, uh, the, you know, overlaid chromatograms, bevacizumab and rituximab are at the maximum concentration that we evaluated them at 300 micromolar, um, 200 microliter injection. The effect of injection concentration, um, uh, again, you know, if you look at the capture efficiency, what we see is that even at 300 micromolar concentration, we are able to capture over 99% of the antibody on the column. Now, the characterization of the uh, nitrogen binding site column, we wanted to make sure that the elution was not some other or for, you know, foreseeable effect. And to uh, evaluate that, we changed the 
um, the gradients a little bit where we started the illusion buffer, start uh, running, say, you know, like five minutes first, then and then after 12.5 minutes of injection, and then after 20 minutes of injection. And in each case, you can see that the illusion buffer was the driving force to uh, push the antibody out of the column. And the flow rate was also, of course, in effect, as you can see here, as we slow down the flow rate of the, um, the solvent through the column, the illusion of the antibody uh, was delayed. So at the fastest rate that we were running this column at 0 0.7 mils per minute, the antibody eludes are around nine minutes or so. Um, but when, as we slow down the uh, flow rate, the antibody is retarded and you know it eludes later. Of course, also because of the slow uh, you know flow, the peaks also get broadened out as expected. Um, uh, salt effect of salt in the original uh, sample that's injected on the column was evaluated as you know I uh, mentioned earlier uh, we use salt to capture the antibody so increased salt concentration in the buffer that the antibody is uh, present doesn't really negatively affect the antibody or the column's ability to capture the antibody so um, zero molar sodium chloride in the sample buffer where the you know the antibody was uh, kept before injection or versus three molar didn't really make any uh, significant changes in the ability to capture the antibody. And lastly, we evaluated the effect of uh, pH uh, of the illusion buffer on the antibody. And what we saw was that the uh, decreased pH, you know, increased acidity had a negative effect negative impact of, on our ability to capture this antibody, probably due to uh, the antibody starting to misfold and lose its uh, structure and, you know, stick to the column or the resin uh, more drastically. Um, if we have salt in the equilibration buffer, as expected, the capture efficiency is reduced. Um, and or I, I'm sorry, I meant the other way around. If, if the salt in the elution buffer is high at three molar sodium chloride, the capture efficiency is really high. If we reduce the salt concentration, the capture efficiency is sacrificed. And bevacizumab was perhaps, was still effectively captured at two uh, molar sodium chloride, but for trastuzumab at two molar sodium chloride, we were already uh, losing part of the antibody and we were unable to capture 100% of the antibody, unfortunately. And you know, if you look at this uh, results here for different antibodies, we have slightly different capture efficiencies. Rituximab and bevacizumab at three molar sodium chloride, we have 99% uh, capture efficiency. Typically with lowered salt concentrations, the antibody capture efficiency is reduced. Uh, but for antibodies like trastuzumab and mogomilizumab, you can see that this efficiency is, is even more drastically affected. And BSA is a control uh, here. Now, yeah, Bevis, here's the uh, same chart again, Bevis, zoom up, uh, the chromatogram is shown on the left. Now, the specificity of the uh, interaction. So to test this, uh, we replaced the nucleotide binding site ligand with uh, glycine and in the, the injections, as you can see on the right, the uh, BSA, of course, doesn't get uh, captured, um, but likewise, uh, bevacizumab or rituximab are not captured on this control columns either. If uh, the nucleotide binding site ligand is replaced with uh, the glycine, uh, showing that the nucleotide binding site ligand is necessary. Now, when it comes to the universal applicability of the uh, antibody purification, these columns did not perform um, the same for all antibodies. And what you can see is that we have a few different ligands for a few different you know, uh, columns that we generated. And it's not only that, but it's also the loading density of the ligand on the resin uh, makes a difference in terms of the column's ability to capture and retain these antibodies. And what it comes down to it is that uh, individual KD, individual monovalence affinity of the ligand 
to the antibody. And for uh, some antibodies, the same ligand has, um, well, can have a range of an order of magnitude affinity um, depending on whether or not that nucleotide binding site is easily accessible or if there are residues at the lip of that structure preventing the nucleotide binding site ligand having easy access to that binding pocket. Now, if you look at the results, the control in any one of those examples on the, you know, the table on the right, uh, none of these antibodies were really captured at any, any good efficiency. The MBS ligand 2 in this table uh, was good for some antibodies, but uh, not all of those, and was nucleotide binding site ligand 4. And like I mentioned, we have multiple different ligands that we have used, and you know we can always find a ligand that works well for you know multiple different antibodies, but not so great for some others. And... Uh, if we take a sample of the antibody that we want to purify and run a few injections on different columns, we can identify the resin that will work the best for that antibody. The Boi serum, serum albumin challenge is to show that the column doesn't capture the BSA. And in this case, we have a column, we have, inject, we have injections of BSA at increasing concentrations, uh, none of which is captured and all the BSA comes out at the you know the, the void volume and when we mix it with something like bevacizumab at 10 micromolar which is a 60 fold you know difference in uh concentration at the highest bsa concentration the bevacizumab peak uh, appears tiny in comparison to bsa that's why it's uh it's hard to see the bevacizumab uh peak but it is actually the same intensity as the earlier columns that we have shown. So what we do is we collect these after the injections and then we investigate it to flow through, right, the void volume uh, peak to the elution peak. And at these different concentrations, you can see that the uh, uh, BSA uh, contaminating into the elution uh, peak is at very low concentrations and the, the, uh, the light chain and the heavy chain of the antibody are labeled on the uh, the gel on the right, and perhaps it, if you have such high contamination with the BSA, a second injection would be um, necessary to purify it further. And uh, likewise, rituximab is also captured through, and what we're showing here is the um, the ability of the antibody to capture these, the, the ability of the column to capture these antibodies with such high concentrations of contaminants. And yes, there's a reduction in our ability to capture the antibody if the contaminant uh, concentration is so high, unsurprisingly, especially with something like albumin, which is very sticky, probably, you know, sticking to the surface of the resin, preventing the nucleotide binding site ligand to interact uh, with the antibodies. Hence, um, the, the uh, efficiency of pur purification is reduced to 91 and to 92 percent for bevacizumab and rituximab in comparison to uh, when the contaminant concentration is not as high, um, which was closer to 99 percent at those times. And then we wanted to see if the impurities or the, the kind of impurities really made a difference in um, the column's ability to purify anything. And so we challenged the column with ascites at different concentrations and transferrin and uh, cell lysates, conditioned media, cell conditioned media with two different cell lines or multiple myeloma cell line and a ovarian cancer cell line. And um, in any one of these cases, we didn't see the column capturing uh, impurities uh, from anything, um, anything else. And uh, the uh, uh, all the uh, all the contaminants came out in the earlier peak. All right, and the column reusability was something else that we evaluated. And after three over three hundred injections, uh, the column was robust. Uh, the nucleotide binding site ligand does not elute or leach off of the resin. So uh, unlike 
you know, protein A or protein G columns, uh, this column is pretty much indestructible. I and mean, you just put it in 20% ethanol and keep it in the fridge and it will last forever. All right. Now I'm going to uh, shift gears just a little bit and tell you a little bit more about uh, another project that has been going on in the lab. Instead of using resin, in this particular case, we uh, were using membranes. So what we do is we take the membrane and then we functionalize the membrane again using um, our nucleotide binding site ligands and uh, capture, use multiple of these uh, membranes, lay them on top of each other and, and uh, well, sandwich them in between these two frits and uh, put them on a spin column, you know, application, using a spin column application where you, where you take an Eppendorf, put the, uh, you know, spin column inside the Eppendorf. You, we first wash the column using the, uh, the equilibration buffer, just spin it, wash the resin, uh, I mean the membrane. And then we add in the sample that has contaminants in it, use the centrifugal force to push the liquid through, antibody gets captured on the membrane, contaminants go through, and then we use um, another drop of you know, a equilibration buffer uh, to wash off the contaminants that may be still in the fritz or the membranes. And then in the next step, we use the elution buffer and uh, you know, just get the antibody out of the captured you know, membranes and at the bottom of the tube. So uh, here we show that the monoclonal antibody um, in the case of no membranes just goes through the fritz immediately. And if the membranes are not functionalized, again, all these antibodies that we have on the right, we tested, uh, you know, a variety of different antibodies. I believe there are eight of them here. None of them are captured, basically. And whatever you see in the, you know, equilibration buffer in the second step or the elution buffers is the things that are, you know, minuscule amounts that were left in the fritz, uh, in the pores, etc. None of them were effectively captured. So what we do is we take um, a membrane, right, and we using carboxylation, we generate a carboxylic acid functionalization on the surface of the membrane and then using typically an um, amide uh, coupling, we would just go ahead and couple uh, and functionalize these membranes. And by the way, these membranes are typically cellulose membranes. And uh, then here is, you know, what, what changes is the number of membranes that we use to pack on top of each other, which will affect the binding capacity. Um, and we are investigating things like uh, how much can we capture, what's the retention rate, and is it universally applicable? And, you know, is in the case where we, the, we were modifying the resins, it wasn't universally applicable. We had a few different resins that we would be suitable for a variety of different antibodies, but we didn't have one resin that worked for everything. Um, so we wanted to investigate if that was true for uh, this membrane uh, columns, the spin columns as well. But um, for our luck, it turned out to be much more, you know, broadly applicable. So you can see that the um, original uh, samples, you know, the, the so there are five, um, you know, different regions that we show in this graph. The first one is when you load the sample, uh, wash it through. There isn't much antibody left in it because you know we captured most of it. We do a wash with the equilibration buffer. Uh, there isn't much antibody in that one either. When we do the elution buffer, uh, elution buffer one, we capture most of the antibody. When we repeat the process to wash off uh, any unelluded antibodies, there is again not much antibody. So a single uh, application of the spin column is very successful in. Uh, purifying all these eight different antibodies. And uh, here are the recoveries. They're always in the, you know, 90 to 95% range, uh, successful recovery. And it's not just that antibodies are not just captured as, you know, molecules. We wanted to make sure that these antibodies that we captured are still functional, are able to bind to their antigens. And so we use trastuzumab and uh, using flow cytometry 
um, using breast cancer, the SKBR3 cell lines, we were able to uh, bind and label these breast cancer cell lines. Um, is trastuzumab is an uh, anti-HER2 uh, receptor binding antibody. And, uh, you know, when we compare the nuclear binding side, you know, uh, membranes to protein A membranes, uh, the uh, purities that we, you know, manage to get out of these spin columns are very com comparable. You can see that uh, uh, there, when there's no contaminant, when we contaminate the samples with BSA, ascites, or uh, the CHO cell uh, conditioned media, uh, if you compare the gels on the left and the right, you will see that the purities of the antibodies being purified using our uh, MBS spin columns versus the protein A spin columns are very comparable and we're getting similar efficiencies and purity. As uh, summarized here, the host cell DNA and host cell protein, uh, you know, contaminants in either one of those are also negligible and comparable to protein A. So I want to wrap up here. Um, what I've shown here is that, you know, we identified a small, well, a few different small molecules that we use to target the nucleotide binding site. Uh, for fast, simple, and efficient antibody purification, we typically get over you know ninety percent recovery of these antibodies. They're active. They're also bivalently active. It's not just one of the arms, uh, but typically you need to have both of the arms to be active so that the nucleotide binding site ligands um, work with multivalency, and, and the efficiency of the capture is much more um, you know consistent. And the elution conditions are gentle. The captured antibodies uh, retain their activity for their antigens. And um, the cost is significantly lost compared to protein A and G uh, applications. The columns are easy to maintain. Uh, they're you know, practically indestructible. And um, yeah, uh, we're very confident in moving these forward for uh, more, hopefully, uh, industrial applications. And with that, uh, I would like to thank all our funding agencies and um, all the students, graduate students who did the work. Most of this work was done during the pandemic, so that's why they're in this picture, they're wearing their masks. Um, and then several of them have graduated now and moved on to uh, industrial positions. And with that, thank you for your attention. Um,